today uh, we're coming to Romans chapter 4 and let, let's, uh, let's start by reading this all together. Romans 4.17, this will be our key verse for today. Ready? Go. As it is written, I have appointed you a father of many nations in the sight of God, whom he believed, who gives life to the dead, and calls the things not being as being. That's right. So, as you can see from the title, uh, the key phrase is at the very end of the verse, what we'll emphasize this morning is God, whom he believed, who calls things not being as being. God who calls things not being as being. So, uh, first of all, what does this mean? This just means uh, bringing something into being out of nothing. All right, there's nothing, and then there's something. All right, so God calls the things not being as being. And I like how it also, it's in the present tense. It says, uh, not who gave life to the dead and called things not being as being, but who gives life to the dead. What is God doing today? He wants to give life to the dead, and even today, call things not being as being. All right, so we want to see what does this mean and how can we experience this. Now this, uh, if, if we would have had enough space, uh, this, you would have seen that what Romans 4 is covering is it's talking about Abraham, a figure in Genesis in the Old Testament. And this verse actually refers to two really important events in Abraham's life. The first, who gives life to the dead, is a reference to the time when Abraham was about to offer his son Isaac. But, of course, uh, God stopped him, and instead there was a, a ram caught in a thicket close by, and he ended up offering the ram. Uh, but that whole experience of Abraham about to offer his son Isaac, and then instead uh, the ram, this, is, uh, this is, uh, can be summarized in this short phrase here. It's an allusion to resurrection. So you could say it's his experience of God giving life to the dead. God giving life to the dead. But then uh, the second thing mentioned in this verse at the end there is God calls the things not being as being. Not being as being. And this, again, if you look at the whole chapter there, you realize what this refers to. This refers to the experience of Isaac's being born. Um, and uh, let, let's look at these next set of verses. Sorry, the reference uh, should be Genesis 17, 1 through 2 and 17. So uh, that's a misprint. But let, let me read these verses to you, all right? And you could, you could uh, th so this is a story, part of the story of Isaac's birth. And it says, And when Abraham was 99 years old, Jehovah appeared to Abram, and said to him, I am the all-sufficient God, walk before me and be perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Who, sorry, will a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? And will Sarah, who is ninety-nine years old, bear a child? All right, so it's really interesting. Uh, many people refer to Abraham as the father of faith, as a great man of faith. But, uh, and, and actually the way it's recorded in Romans 4, it says, I have appointed you a father of many nations, referring to Abraham. And it says, in the sight of God, whom he believed. So it tells us clearly that Abraham believed. But the funny thing is, what was Abraham's actual reaction in Genesis 17 when God said, I will multiply you exceedingly. What, what was Abraham's reaction? According to the verses there, what did he do? What did he do? Laugh. He laughed, that's right. He laughed and said, will a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? In other words, they're, they're, this, this is absolutely crazy. There's no way that this could happen. There's no way that I could, um, that, that, that I could have a child, let alone be multiplied exceedingly. Uh, so how do how do we uh, how do you how do you reckon? It seems like these are contradictory things. On the one hand, Abraham believed God. On the other hand, uh, it seems like he laughed at God. He laughed at God. Um, well, uh, I think uh, it, again, if you look at all of Romans four, um, there's something called circumcision mentioned here, and Abraham uh, did 
carry out circumcision according to God's commandment. Um, but I, I would say, I would say, is this is this is this your experience? This is my experience. Uh, on the one hand, we, we, we kind of live a, a paradoxical life. On the one hand, we are believers, and we love the Lord. On the other hand, sometimes our reaction to the Lord may be uh, a not, not complete belief. In fact, maybe we, just, we might even laugh at the Lord. We might even laugh at the Lord. But, but um, I, I was... Uh, what what I what I like about Abraham here is that uh, is that he was uh, he was truthful, he was sincere, right in his interaction with God. Actually, actually, if you look at what he said, he he wasn't totally truthful. Um, he just said, "Oh, that Ishmael, another son, might live before you." Um, but uh, I think one one uh, one key thing in our interacting with the Lord, the Lord may speak something to us, we may not. Believe it, or we may, we may, it may be seem too impossible for this to happen. But uh, we need to be honest with the Lord. We need to be honest with the Lord. In uh, John four twenty four, it says, "Those who worship God must worship in spirit and <coughs> truthfulness, and truthfulness, honesty, sincerity." So um, maybe maybe we're maybe we're, uh, we're we're in the process. We are in the process. And how how do we? Experience God who calls things not being as being. Well, it starts with being honest. It starts with being honest with the Lord. Uh, maybe we don't don't believe something. We we'll just say, Lord, I I can't do this. I, I don't I don't know if this is really going to be able to happen. I I think this is impossible. But it's through that interaction that the Lord can actually work it out. Um, so number one is we just need to uh, interact with the Lord. All right. Uh, I forgot that we were going to be in this room, that we weren't going to have a, a board here. So um, we'll just have to work through this next part together. But, uh, okay, this last part again calls the things not being as being. Again, if I had a board here, I would put on one side um, not being, and then on the other side being. Okay? Um, now, in light of that, let's, uh, let's read 2 Corinthians for, let, me, let me read to you 2 Corinthians 4.16. Alright. Uh, what are the things that the things that have being and what are the things that are not? Alright. In a very simple way, uh, the way we're going to put it today, uh, and it's based on uh, some verses in the Bible. I guess one verse you could say is John 8.58. It says, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham came into being, I am. I am. What does that mean? That means God Himself, the Lord Jesus, He is the verb to be. In other words, apart from God, nothing else is. If we don't have God, you know, in computer science, there's only two things, zero and one. You either, you're either one or you're zero, and that's it. Um, if you have God, you have everything. You have being. Without God, there is nothing. Um, and we, let's... Uh, so as we read uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, actually this is 16 and 17. Actually, sorry, this is 16, 17, and 18. So another reference error. Uh, we're gonna, we want to we wanna make a little chart to compare and contrast not being and being. All right? So think about that. What would you put on both sides? All right. Uh, Therefore, we do not lose heart. I hope, you know, it's kind of getting towards the middle of the semester. And uh, so remember this verse. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. All right, outer man is decaying, inner man is being renewed day by day. For our momentary lightness of affliction works out for us more and more surpassingly an eternal weight of glory. All right, Because we do not regard the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So it's, re- it's really easy to see a compare and contrast in each of these phrases, in these verses, right? And so in the first phrase you have what? You have outer man decaying, and then you have the inner man being renewed. Uh, you have what momentary lightness of affliction, 
And then on this side, you got what? Eternal weight, Eternal weight of glory. All right. What? And then next is things that are seen, things that are not seen. And then lastly, temporary and eternal. All right. Again, so on this side, we've got the inner man. Oh, sorry. No, this side is the outer man. Momentary lightness of affliction, the things which are seen and temporary. And on this side, you've got the inner man being renewed. You've got eternal weight of glory, the things which are not seen, and the things which, and that which is eternal. That which is eternal. So, actually, you could, you could summarize the Christian life this way, very simply. What is the Christian life? It is a life of... In the be, of having the process of going from, by default, we all we're all on this side, all right. We're all we all we all consider the things that are seen. We all consider uh, our our outer man is just our soul with our body apart from our spirit, which was created to worship God. Uh, we, we just we're just considering our our body, our soul, um, and uh, we're considering although we 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 may not. We may forget it, but we're involved with temporary things. Temporary. All right? And uh, I think we can all identify with affliction. Right? Affliction. Human life is full of affliction. But the Christian life is a life of being transferred from... In, in, I, I like how it says... It uses the word regard. All right? It uses the word regard. Um, what we regard changes... When we love the Lord Amen. and when we know the Lord. Amen. And there is a transfer of what we regard from all of these things to all of these things. Amen. All right? From the things that seemingly are real, seemingly, I could, seemingly, this wall is real. Seemingly. Um, but because it's not eternal, it's actually not real. Yeah. But we. We are being transferred from the things that are not to the things that are. The things that are not being to the things that have been. All right? And actually, it's really interesting. Not only are we being transferred, and again, of course, uh, we still have to live in this earth. I mean, still, we still have to go to school, still have to study, still have to sleep, you still have to eat, still have to take care of the necessities of life. But it's very interesting. So, it's, it's a transfer of regard, but the God actually, he actually, these things are necessary. And these things are used by the Lord to help us transfer to this side. Mm-hmm. All right? Like it says, uh, if, if there wasn't the momentary lightness of affliction, mm-hmm. it would be hard to work out the eternal weight of glory. Mm-hmm. But it is possible to just go through the momentary lightness of affliction and miss the eternal weight of glory. But the purpose of it, actually the purpose of the momentary lightness of affliction is to work out the eternal weight of glory. So uh, God, God does not promise us a life free of affliction. Um, we have to go through the same things everyone else does. But in the midst of all of these things. A transfer is being made from the momentary lightness of affliction to the eternal weight of glory. And from the things which are seen to the things which are not seen. Uh, we're, we're just in this process. All right, so now th- what we come to in the next two verses, uh, this, is, uh, this is important, all right? 2 Corinthians 5.17, how about all the, all the girls, all the sisters? Read 2 Corinthians 5.17, and all the guys, all the brothers, read Galatians 6.15. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So, so then, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, they have become new. Good. All right, Galatians six fifteen. For neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation is what matters. Yeah, that's right. All right, so again, we have the old things, Right? And then we have, or you could say, the old creation. And then we also have the new creation. All right? And it's not just that the old things were terminated 
and then there's a completely new beginning with a new creation, right? According to 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, yes, the old things have passed away, but it doesn't say, and God created a new creation. What does it say? They have become. The old things have become new. All right? And what makes old things, the things on this side, new? According to 2 Corinthians 5.17, it's very simple. It says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So, if we add Christ to all of these things, then we become the new creation. The Lord works out the new creation. And I like how it is there in Galatians 6.15. Just like in 2 Corinthians 4.16, it talks about what do we regard. What do we regard? In Galatians 6, it talks about what matters. What matters? What's important? Well, the new creation is what's important. We can see a lot of things of the old creation. But what's important, what matters, is the new creation. And uh, I, I would just like to uh, apply, apply this in a couple of ways. One is this word new. This word new. All right? How is your Christian walk with the Lord? Are you feeling new and fresh with the Lord? <laughs> um, if we are in this process, like it said in 2 Corinthians 4, it used that word, being renewed, right? Being renewed, and it used the phrase day by day. Being renewed day by day. Not Sunday by Sunday, not month to month, not year to year, but day, day by day. Are you enjoying the Lord freshly? Um, this is a sign. Uh, if if we're just if we just if we're feeling just old, um, going through the routine, uh, maybe uh, maybe we come to Bible study or or we maybe we read our Bibles. Maybe we read our Bibles every day. Uh, maybe we talk with other believers, fellowship. But uh, we're missing the newness, the freshness. Well, this process of moving from the things which are seen to the things which are not seen is a process that should make the Lord fresh to us. If we're in this process, the Lord is fresh. The Lord is new. He's living. Um, we are, we're joyful. We're, uh, we're just, we're renewed. We're renewed. Um, so, regardless of uh, where we are or what we are, how long we've been a believer, how much you read the Bible. Um, every day, we need to touch the Lord who is new. Actually, there is a, uh, there's a, a verse in Revelation 21.5. It says, He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Amen. I make all things new. Uh, you know, the, there's a lot of, there's always new stuff coming out. iPhone 6, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but you know what? Actually, the iPhone 6 is it's, it's really old. There's only one thing that is new in this universe, and that's always new, and that is the Lord Jesus. Amen. When we touch the Lord, He's new. All right? He makes all things new. So again, got all these things. If we're enjoying the Lord, even if we're going to, going to uh, the same class, same professor, same room, whatever, actually... We were we. There's something new. Um, there is not boredom. There is newness because we're enjoying the Lord, and that's the way we should be. All right. Uh, time is running out, but uh, the other the other way I'd like to apply this is you know Abraham's experience of God calling the things not being as being was related to, like it used that word multiply, right? It says, I will multiply you exceedingly. And so, in our own Christian walk, we need to see God calling things not being as being. That is, you know, moving us from here to here. But actually, with regard to our view of other people, we need the same kind of view that God has. All right? And... Uh, we may look at look at certain people, maybe we're in a class, certain friends, and we we might we might be sitting next to them and have this little feeling, 
just this little feeling, this person needs the Lord Jesus. And then we look at the things that are seen. And then we look at who they are, the way that they're dressed, the color of their hair, um, they're, what, what they're doing in class while the professor is talking. Um, and we might be like, we might, we might have the same reaction that Abraham had, actually. We might laugh at the Lord. Not outwardly, but inwardly. Be like, oh man, there's, there's no way that this guy will ever get to know the Lord Jesus. Um, um, but you know, we should do, we should, then we, if we have that little feeling, we should just, again, we should be honest with the Lord, sincere Lord. I don't know about this guy, but uh, I give this person to you. All right. So I just want to read you a short story about uh, a similar situation. All right. This is uh, okay. Here, here we go. So it says uh, one sister gathered a group of women together once a week and led them in a Bible study. So there's a Bible study, a women's Bible study. The women all worked in the same company, and none of them believed in the Lord. So this is a really interesting Bible study. All right? <laughs> there's a sister there, and there's a bunch of people. They're reading the Bible, but none of them had believed in the Lord. One of them was very particular about her dress, the way she dressed. She was very proud and would not listen to anything the sister said. The sister took notice of her and prayed for her. All right? Prayed for her. Um, she asked God to give her the opportunity to speak to the woman. One day she felt a desire to invite the woman over for tea. All right, I like this. Um, it doesn't say she felt a desire to invite her straight to the Sunday morning meeting. Right? Now, there, there may be a time and place to do that. But I like what it says here. First, what did she do? Um, she prayed. And second, she just invited her over for tea. All right? Uh, invited her for, you know, Starbucks or whatever it is, all right? Since this woman loved to socialize, she accepted the invitation. When she came, the sister encouraged her to believe in the Lord. She replied, I cannot believe. I like to gamble and I love pleasure. I do not want to lose those things. I cannot believe in the Lord Jesus. All right. The sister said something interesting. Uh, I, I'm, if I, I, I wouldn't have necessarily said the same thing, but her, her heart was right. All right. The sister said, If a person wants to believe in the Lord Jesus, she has to stop gambling. Anyone who wants to believe in the Lord Jesus must give up vainglory. You have to give up these things if you want to believe in the Lord Jesus. The woman said, The price is too high. I cannot afford it. The sister said, I hope you will go back and consider it. After she had said this, this being the, uh, not the sister, but the woman who was being talked to, Oh, sorry, no, sorry, this is the sister. After she had said this, she continued to pray for her. So she invited her over for tea, spoke something, was rejected, right? And, but she continued to pray for her. She, she, she didn't give up. Uh, this woman that she had spoken to returned home and remarkably knelt down to pray. After she prayed, she suddenly said, I have decided to follow the Lord Jesus today. All right, She changed suddenly. She could not explain it, but her heart just turned. She changed her attire. She no longer dressed the same as before. Wonderful things followed one after another. Within a year, many of her colleagues were brought to the Lord one by one. All right, listen. You may think that it is difficult to talk to someone, but if you pray for him, the Lord will give you the opportunity to speak to him, and he will change. All right. Again, this is this. There's no way. It's too it's too difficult to talk to this person about the Lord. What do we need to do? We need to pray. Uh, the sister who was having Bible studies had been afraid to speak to the woman. All right. Anyone ever feel afraid? You ever feel afraid to talk to someone about the Lord? Many times I do. Uh, she was afraid to speak to the woman because the woman behaved as though she knew everything and could do everything. Very confident. Seemingly confident. She appeared to be very arrogant, but the Lord gave the sister the burden to pray for her. One day, the Lord told the sister to speak to her. She put aside her considerations and spoke to her. 
You have to pray on the one hand and learn to open your mouth on the other. After you have prayed for a person for some time, the Lord will impress you to speak to him. You will have to tell him about the Lord's grace and the things that he has done for you. He will not be able to resist you because he cannot oppose the things that the Lord has done for you. Anyway, I'm sure there's a lot of stories that we could uh, refer to, but... uh, the Lord specializes in impossible cases. Those are the, those are the ones that he wants the most. Uh, just like Saul, who was the foremost in persecuting believers at his time. That's the one the Lord Jesus wanted. He wanted the person who was killing believers to be saved. Um, and there are many, many examples of this throughout history. Uh, we ourselves are the foremost example of uh, someone who... Uh, should have been an impossible case. But yet the Lord still loved us and came to us, all right? So, not being, seemingly, again, when we look at other people, we're not, we're not regarding the things which are seen. If we regard the things which are seen, we'll just be like, impossible. But we have to be those who are regarding the things that are not seen. And uh, then this person, who seemingly can't make it, can actually... Become the same as us. Become the same as us. All right. What time is it? Eleven fifty. Okay, eleven fifty. All right. So we got to. We have to uh, finish this up. All right. Now, uh, Ephesians three seventeen. Let's read this all together. That Christ may make His home in your hearts through faith. That's right. So how does Christ make His home in our hearts? Again, it's through faith. You can't. You can't. How much has Christ made us? It's really hard to say because it's not. You can't see it. But the fact is, every day, through our cooperation, the Lord should be making His home a little bit more in our hearts through faith. All right. Now, uh, we don't have time to get into it too much, but the first part of the verse, Romans 4.17, that we talked about, it says, Who gives life to the dead? Gives life to the dead. And there's a lot of verses in the New Testament, especially in the Gospel of John, where the Lord refers to life, the not just extending our human life, or even making our human life better, but giving us a completely new life, His very life, the life of God, um, a, a, life, a life implant um, into, into, into us. And uh, there's, there's a lot of, there's John 5, 24, right? It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. And in John 10, the Lord tells us, why did, he, why did He become a man? What was the whole point? Well, in John 10, He says, I have come that they may have life and may have it abundantly. What is life? In John 11, Jesus said, I am the life. I am the resurrection and the life. So He Himself, He is this life. Um, we'll skip Revelation 3. Uh, and now, we'll just end with these verses here. Romans 8, 6 and, thir- 6 and 13. Again, it it's, it's kind of goes along with this, who gives life to the dead. Many times we're on the side of dead. That's a perfect opportunity for the Lord to come in to give us life. All right, And uh, we, we may experience this many times throughout the day. Romans 8, 6, right? it says, For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life, is life and peace. Many times by default we're over here, mind set on the flesh, but sometimes the Lord just wakes us up, We turn and we set our mind on the Spirit. And when that happens, life. God gives life to the dead, all right? And the last part of that verse, And if the Spirit of the one who raised Christ, who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who indwells you. So he will give life to your mortal bodies. Uh, This is. Our experience, many times uh, we're tired. Do you ever feel tired? Um, yeah, all right. And uh, we know we should read our Bible, but it just seems so hard to pick it up, open the Bible, and read. There's just some resistance there. In our mortal body, in our mortal body, just be, or we know that it's time to go to a meeting. But man, we just really feel. But then, if someone would say, like, say, um, I, I, don't, I don't know, something you really, really like to do. Say, so you really like uh, um, uh, going shopping or going, 
yeah, or you know, watching something, and some, and then someone calls you up and says, "Hey, we're going to blah blah blah," and all of a sudden, you 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 feel you feel energized. Um, that's because there's something in our mortal bodies, uh, sin, which uh, which is it's, it's an element of death toward the things of the Lord. But if we would be those who just turn to the Lord, set our mind on the Spirit, um, the Lord, I like that, can give life to our mortal bodies. And uh, we can be strengthened to read the Bible, to, uh, to go to the meetings. Um, because by default, again, it's, it's, there's a lot of resistance. There's a lot of resistance. But uh, if we would just be those who set our mind on the Spirit, the Lord can give life and again, we can experience this transfer um, from all of these things on this side to all of the positive things on this side. <laughs>